right. Well, if you haven't been here for a while, maybe, maybe you don't know that we've been in a, a series that's based on a book by Henry Blackaby called Experiencing God. Um, I gave a review generally of all the messages that we've had up to this point. I'm going to, for the sake of time, not do that. If you've missed any of the messages, I would just encourage you to go to oldtownfg.com. Pastor Zach puts them up there each week, and so they're all there for you. Or you can go to our Vimeo page, vimeo.com forward slash oldtownfg, and they're all there, and you can get caught up yourself. Um, But this week... The unit that all of our small groups, those who are participating in the Experiencing God uh, workbook, this, this week's uh, unit is called Crisis of Belief. I'll let Henry Blackaby tell us what he means by that. He says, this chapter focuses on a turning point that is necessary in your following of God's will. When God invites you to join him in his work, He presents a a God-sized assignment that he wants to accomplish through you. It will be obvious that you can't do it on your own. Uh, If God doesn't help you, you will fail. This is the crisis point at which many people decide not to follow what they sense God is leading them to do. Then they wonder why they don't experience God's presence, power, and activity in their life the way that maybe some other Christians do. Um... You know, throughout the Bible, we see stories of people, regular folks like you and I, who were faced with what seemed to be impossible, insurmountable circumstances. Um, several examples, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham having been told by God that he would have a son through his really, really old and crusty wife, who was somewhere around like 90 years old, and he himself was no spring chicken either. He was 100 years old. And he, he had to be thinking, huh, that's impossible. And, you know, it pro- probably was impossible, except that God is the one who told him that is going to happen. What seems impossible is possible through me. And the way the story goes is, of course, Abraham, it's it does happen, and she gives birth to a son, Isaac, and so that's true. Moses, we know in Exodus chapter 14, it's a story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt, and now they're up here against the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army approaching them from the back, and there is like impossible. They're between literally a rock and a hard place. What are they going to do? It's an impossible situation, and of course, you know the story. The sea parts, and then they walk through it, and the water comes back down on Pharaoh's army. It's Pretty awesome. An impossible situation. Gideon, if you haven't read that, it's in Judges chapter 6, chapter 7 and 8. And it tells the story of this man, Gideon, who Israel at that time was under the oppression from, uh, Israel was under the oppression of Midianites. And God told a guy by the name of Gideon that he was going to be the one that was going to rise up and lead an army to defeat the Midianites. And what was impossible about the situation was that God intentionally had Gideon whittle down his army to, it was like the original 300, if you've seen that movie, 300 men to fight against an army that in Judges chapter 8 says was at least 130,000. 130,000 against 300? Forget about it. Except God. God was behind it and intentionally had him whittle down the army so that the Israelites wouldn't be able to say that they did it by their own power. Uh, You have the story of Mary, who was told by an angel that you are going to give birth to a son and not by the normal way that men and women go about producing children. That's impossible. And yet she said, let it be done to me according to what you say. Or Peter, walking on water. I mean, we could go on and on of the examples of these situations that were seemingly impossible except God. And so these are examples, again, where regular, everyday folks like you and me were faced with situations that would require them to believe that God could accomplish impossible things through them for the purpose of bringing glory to himself, for the purpose of demonstrating his love and his faithfulness. And you see, the thing is, we, we, I think that as Bible-believing Christians, most of us believe those stories. I hope you do. If, if, that, if the word says that the sea parted, 
I, be, I believe that. I think, there was, I think I heard somewhere along the line that it wasn't actually the Red Sea. It was the Sea of Reeds. And it was actually just he walked through a, I don't know, some lame thing. I thought, that's dumb. I believe that God quite literally parted the Red Sea. That's awesome. And so but we believe those things. But then comes a situation in your life. Now, fine, it might not be a, a, this huge body of water in front of you. or I mean, quite literally, it is an impossible situation. As Jennifer said, we had five pages of prayer requests this week that we prayed through. Five pages. That's the most that we ever have had. And we love that. I, I'm, I'm glad, but it's just in reading that long list of prayers, I know that some of you are up against a rock and a hard place. Kids who are walking in outright rebellion. Some of you are experiencing like your marriage. It, it hit the fan, and it looks like there is absolutely no hope. It looks like it's been broken beyond repair. Or some of you were received a diagnosis from the doctor that it's not good. Um, all of those things, you, and you could add to the list, are those moments where you are faced with a crisis of belief, meaning where you're forced to wrestle with the question of whether or not God is going to perform the impossible and, and help you to overcome, or not help you, that God in his power will, will overcome whatever impossible situation that is right in front of you right now. You have a choice in those moments to either, and I do too, to depend on our own abilities and our own resources, which often goes bad when we try to do that, trying to manipulate the situation, begging and pleading or doing other things. Um, or otherwise, place our complete faith in God to move on our behalf. Those are the choices. That's the crisis of belief, whether it's some thing that God is calling you to do that seems impossible, or it's simply circumstances that have come your way, and you just don't, you're, you're at a loss. You can't do anything about it. So the reality, I want to read some scriptures here for you that I think are really valuable. If there's a, there's a pin in front of you, you could write these down. They'll be up here on the screen, though. Uh, the reality is that if you're a child of God, no weapon formed against you can prosper, whatever situation. No weapon formed, this is the word of God, Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. And this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I talked last week about our inheritance a little bit, but this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Man, the, so I've, there's, I know that there's people who read that scripture and they'll say, well, that, that, you're taking that out of context. That was really just for the Israelite people under this particular covenant they were in. And I, you know, there's, I firmly believe that this is a promise that you can stand on. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If God is for us, who can be against us? That is awesome. And that's the Apostle Paul saying that in this kind of new covenant that we're in. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us a few things that are okay? That don't read that. It doesn't read that way. Some of you are going, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? All things. See, Jesus proved that he cared so deeply for us by laying his life down for us on the cross. Why would we think that he wouldn't care for us in the crisis that you are in the midst of? The Bible says this, Romans 8, 37, just a few verses later. We are more than conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I'll just, I'll just give you this one last one. Psalm 103, this is a scripture that is stunning. 
we should read this every morning. It's, it says, bless the Lord, Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is it within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives us all our sins, and who forgives, oh, excuse me, and who heals all your diseases. Oh, that means spiritual diseases that he heals us from. That is so wrong. I'm really quickly going to shove this in here because I know somebody's thinking that. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says after uh, Jesus, he healed Peter's ma who had a flu. Jesus went over to her and healed her. And then he went about healing other people. And it says that Jesus did that. And this is Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. You can read it for yourself. Jesus did these things. What things? Healing people, physically healing them. And spiritually, because he forgave them their sins too, which is the root of the disease, whatever. But it says, he did these things, healing people, in order to fulfill what was said by the prophet Isaiah. What, what did the prophet Isaiah say? It re- references you back to, pro- uh, to Isaiah 53, where it says that you know, he was wounded for our transgressions, and so it goes, but by his wounds we were healed. So attaching to physical sickness, what Isaiah said, which is repeated in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, which says that by his wounds you were healed, past tense. So when people say, well, it doesn't really mean heals all your diseases. It means spiritual. It's just nonsense. Just give them those three verses. Anyway, that's just a little bonus for you. Um, who, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. Do you feel like you're in the pit? Well, Jesus redeemed you up from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with jacked up things because he wants to teach you a lesson. <laughs> that's so dumb. I get mad at that. I'm stirring myself up. But, but who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. How many of you old folks would like your youth renewed? I'm not even that old, and I would love my youth to be renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Okay, those are just, those are just a few of the many powerful promises that God communicates in his word. Words that tell us, promises that tell us that God is for you, not against you. It's the devil who seeks to kill and destroy. He's the thief who is robbing you, and we so often blame God. So that is just true. See, but so with all that said, and I, and I try and work very hard, you know, faith is a fight, the Apostle Paul says. It's a good fight of faith. It's, it's a challenge, and I'm engaged in it all the time to cling to these promises as they are my own. I really try to walk in it, but here's the thing. Sometimes what happens to all of us, happens to me, happens to you, I'm sure. Um, It's a common, I guess, mistake that we make when facing uh, impossible situations, which is that rather than focusing on the promises and looking at Jesus and who he is and looking at the Father and his goodness, we focus instead on the jacked up circumstances which is only, all it does is produce uh, and fosters unbelief in our hearts. And so I kind of want to talk about that for just a little bit here, using the example that we find in the book of Matthew, uh, with the, uh, Matthew 14 with Peter walking on water. I know you're very familiar with the story, and you probably know it in and out, but I think sometimes we can become so familiar with something that we kind of lose sight of the rich meaning in it. So I just want to remind you of a truth and a principle that's at work here in the story. It's Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. And it's where Jesus is going to give his disciples a really profound lesson on faith. So it starts, this is after Jesus healed, I mean, excuse me, where he miraculously fed 5,000 people with some kids' lunch. And it's an amazing miracle. It's at this point where they're wrapping things up, and this Jesus says this. Uh, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. Now, he insists that they get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was still there, and he was there all alone. Uh, I, I just want you to see that because I believe that Jesus knew was what was just about to happen. You guys go without me, okay? Make sure you get in the boat and go across the water. I'm going to be over here in order to set them up for this lesson that's about to happen here. The next verse. Meanwhile, the disciples, while Jesus is there sleeping, uh, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, 
because a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. Well, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on water. Well, when the disciples saw him walking on water, they were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on water. And so Jesus said, all right then, come on. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink and save me, Lord, he shouted. Okay, really quickly, the first thing here that Jesus said to uh, his disciples in the midst of their fear when they see him walk in the water thinking he's a ghost was, don't be afraid. It's me, I'm here. He's communicating his presence in the midst of the wind and the waves. Uh, And Peter's faith in that calming presence of Jesus empowered him to walk on water. The fact that the wind and the waves were blowing so badly and the dark waves beneath them, that didn't faze him at first. But as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked down at the circumstances that he was in, you know, the wind and the waves, fear took over. Unbelief entered in, and that's when he began to sink into the water. And I would say that the same thing happens to us when we take our eyes off of Jesus and begin to focus on the jacked upness of our circumstances, uh, you know, dark, uh, dark, the, uh, the uh, doubt begins to creep in and we begin to sink and we begin to flounder in fear and unbelief. You know, Moses is an- another example of this principle. You know, when, when God told Moses that he was the one that was going to be delivering God's people out of Egypt, uh, Moses immediately began to look down at circumstances, really began to look inwardly at himself. I have a few things here, a few verses really quickly to communicate that. Uh, first, one of those thoughts was, yeah, I'm, t- I'm not good enough. He says this is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Sure, at one time he was the prince of Egypt, but then he, if you know the story, he ended up killing an Egyptian, and he has to go out into the sticks for 40 years. So whatever power and influence that he did have, it was all lost and probably had a warrant out for his arrest. But he's like, who am I? Who am I? I once was something, but now I'm nothing. So doubt, just looking inwardly at himself, seeing his inadequacy. Uh, you see that here. Uh, if they, what if they don't believe me? Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Suppose they won't believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord didn't really appear to you, you liar. So he had that doubt creeping in. I'm a horrible speaker, he said. Uh, Exodus 4.10. This is one that almost kept me from doing, saying yes to this role that I'm in. Like, I not taught good ghetto. And uh, I was really, really fearful of that. And I still struggle sometimes. (laughs) But Exodus 4.10, oh, Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you've spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and I'm slow of tongue. So, again, looking at his, himself and, and reasons why he can't do this impossible thing that God is calling him to. And then even when God says, with an exclamation mark, I don't know if that's in the original Hebrew, I'm sure it wasn't, but he says, look, you're going. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the words to speak. I'm going to teach you what to say. And what does Moses do even with that? He said, I'm going to be with you. And he's like, just, can you please just send somebody else? I don't want to do it. And of course, God had this righteous indignation. And he's like, you're going. And he sent his brother Aaron with him anyhow. In both cases, we have these prime examples of, both in Peter and Moses, uh, two situations where they directed their attention on the circumstances and the impossibility of what they were faced with, instead of focusing their attention on who God is and on his power, who, who, and this wonderful father of ours who specializes in performing the impossible. You know, and when Peter succumbs to that, what is the first thing that, that Jesus says? This is in Matthew 14, 31. 
Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, said, you of little faith, you of little faith, why did you doubt? See, if Peter would have kept his eyes on Jesus, he really would have continued to walk on water, walking back to the boat with Jesus. But he doubted, and that doubt caused him to sink. Uh, there's, let me read you a statement from Experiencing God. He says, how you respond when you reach a crisis of belief will determine whether or not you proceed with God in something that only he can do or whether you continue on your own way and miss what God has purposed for your life. This is not a one-time experience. How you live your life on a daily basis is a testimony of what you believe about God. That's really true. When we're faced with the impossible and we begin to doubt it really, it's, it communicates what we believe to be true about God. Well, you're not really that faithful because I know that I'm just going to succumb to this whatever it may be. And it, dem- it communicates what we c- truly believe about God. See, but as Christians, it, we should be pursuing this way in which we can live simply with, well, like the Bible says, walking by faith not by sight. I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Walking by faith, not by sight. We see in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith is not about what you see. Faith comes by hearing. No, that's not right. That's the wrong verse. It's what, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I've been reading so much scripture. It's just like coming out of me. No, um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things that are not seen but we as people we are so driven by what we see taste smell feel touch we're so moved by our emotions and what happens is it really it begins to chip away at our faith it it increases our unbelief and i think what if jesus operated that way i heard this wonderful truth from a a buddy of mine his name is mike hesh this guy you have to you have to look him up sometime h-o-e S-C-H for the record here on the video. Mike Hesh is a guy who got delivered from this cancerous growth that was hanging outside his body. He had it for like something like eight years and finally received healing. He didn't even have a doctor do anything to it. It just disappeared after six months. Anyhow, uh, he has a powerful testimony, but he was sharing something about faith and belief. And he was talking about if God... Uh, Jesus operated like we do. Imagine Jesus coming out of the tomb after the third day and coming out of that tomb. He's full of life and he's thinking, Father, I knew your, that your word was true. I knew I could depend on you and that you would be faithful to raise me from the dead. And he steps out into the light, but then he looks down at his hands and sees the, the holes in them and a, that hole in his side. And imagine him operating like us going, oh my Father, I'm not really healed, and you know, it's incomplete, and he begins to run back into the tomb, and, but that's not how he operated. He was able to look down at the nail scars and go, yep, I'm, I'm, they needed to be able to look at the nail-pierced hands. They, that will, they will look upon him whom they pierced, it says, and I don't remember, what, I think it's in Zechariah. Jesus knew the word so well that he could look down at the scars and go, yeah, of course, it was supposed to be like that. Because one day everybody's going to look upon me and they're going to see these scars. And then it produce belief in Thomas. So see what I'm saying? We so often operate by what we see and what we feel. You know, throughout life, we're going to be faced with opportunities you know, some t- uh, to demonstrate faith in our Father in spite of what we see. And we have a choice to look at our circumstances and the storms that are raging all around us or otherwise keep our eyes on Jesus and place our faith in the goodness of God, believing that he is for us and not against us, believing that our faith can actually move mountains. Now, here is where I'm going to b- blow some of you up, and I'm, I'm just going to share this as something that I'm, I'm working through. Okay, I haven't arrived yet. Anybody who says they got this stuff figured out is full of it. Trust me, I've read some commentaries, and I'm like thinking, you're... Anyway, not everybody's got this stuff figured out. And so you should be people who are hearing what I'm saying or any 
Bible teacher and say, mm, I'm going to go look that up myself and study and be a Berean. Don't just take what I say as gospel. I, try, I tell you, I work so hard to make sure that what I'm presenting to you is accurate and truthful. I promise you, because I know that I'm going to have to stand before him one day and give an account. So I'm not messing around. I really am looking at all sides. I don't, I don't, I, I'll read a Calvinist view and I'll read an Armenian view. I'll just, I look at all sides. So in this particular case, uh, it's people take issue with this scripture. Let me read it to you first. And then I got to hustle and move along here. It's Mark 11, 23 through 24. These are the red letter words of Jesus and you can't ignore them. You have to do something with them. It says this, truly I say to you, true, this is Jesus talking. Truly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, let me give you context. He's talking to his disciples here. Right? He's talking to his disciples here about the nature of faith. Just in case. But he says to his disciples, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart, no doubt, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Wow, that's a heavy, heavy scripture. And if it's true, it has profound implications. I'm telling you, I read Gospel Coalition. I read some Reformed Theological website on this and how they try to kind of watered down what it's actually meaning or otherwise change the audience with one uh, gospel coalition said, oh, well, he's just, Jesus is only talking to the 12 disciples. This is just for those guys. They came up the mountain of transfiguration and this is just for them and it's not for us, which I'm just, I don't believe that to be true because we also know that it wasn't the disciples who were only given the power to cast out demons and heal the sick. That was given to another 70 who were sent out in pairs. And then look at the book of Acts and you see that that was multiplied over. So to say that it was only to confine that to the 12, I don't know. I guess investigate that for yourself, but I think that's not right. And I think what happens is, see, people get, I, I see why people need to explain this away because what happens is you pray for the thing. Say the mountain is cancer in somebody that you loved and you're praying for this mountain to be removed and you have faith and that person dies. Well then, does that mean I didn't have enough faith? So it's my fault? And that's a heavy burden for people to carry. They think, well, what are you saying? That people are offended by the idea that my lack of faith might have been, uh, caused me to have not experienced the things of God. Which, like, you know, if you think of this with, with there, in, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 17, there's this point where the, this guy tried to have the disciples heal his boy from uh, demon possession. They couldn't do it. So then this guy brings him to Jesus and goes, your boys couldn't do it. And so uh, they, in communicating to Jesus, for like, you know, what do we do wrong? And Jesus in Matthew 17, 17, you faithless and perverse generation, how much, how much longer do I got to put up with you? Now imagine Peter going, oh, what are you talking about? I haven't got enough faith. You're putting it on me? That's on you. You're Jesus. Or, you know, what, can you imagine Jesus coming at him like that? Or coming out the water? Which, which he did. Jesus said, man, where's your faith? And, and they get on the boat and go, what do you mean, Jesus? Talking about me not having enough faith? I have faith. That's on you. But Peter didn't say that. Who does that? We do. We do. What are you saying? I don't have enough faith to receive the thing that... Well, I'd rather it be on me than on God. Anyway, so I think it's, there's a, something in here about, as I'm, and I'm just working through this, like I said, but people get offended by the idea that it could be you and your faith is lacking because you have unbelief because the first thing you do is, yeah, well, what about, what is the guy's name? Theophilus or whatever dude was left behind because Paul, the homeboy, the guy was sick and so he didn't get healed and people bring up the, all these things. Well, yeah, but what about this? Well, what about that? Yeah, okay, but what about what Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 23 and 24? And I'm still working through it. But, and here's one last thing. <laughs> it's unfortunate because you know what's happened is the prosperity gospel preachers have 
done, done a disservice. They've hijacked the word prosperity. In 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, John says, he says, Beloved, I pray that in every way you may prosper and enjoy good health, even as your soul prospers. There's prosper, 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 but because of people who abuse their, their influence, they hijack that, and now prosperity gets a bad name when really God wants you to be well and prosper. He came to you have life and have it to the full. And so what if we dared to believe that what Jesus says here is actually true, and whatever circumstance, whatever mountain you're faith, faced with, you can, in faith, resting on the promises and the goodness of God, say, I know that this is not God's will for my life, that I be jacked up and tore up and, and broken, and I know that's not my God. He came that I have life and have it to the full. I know that all the benefits that are spoken of in 103, those are mine. And so in the name of Jesus, I just command cancer, be cast into the sea. And then what if it doesn't happen? Well, then you're in the presence of Jesus, okay? But, but who cares? You know, you can't win for lose. I like the attitude of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Man, Rude, you're going to be done right here, okay? I don't even know if I have it on here. Oh, snap. Okay, yeah, I do. Jan chapter 3. This is not going to be on the screen. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you don't know the story, they're about to be thrown in the flames by King Nebuchadnezzar because they refuse to bow down to his dumb idol. But they, in throwing him in the flames, they say to him, to Nebuchadnezzar, say, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. These are bold guys. If we're thrown in the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it. So he's able to, they say, but not only that, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. Talk about faith or life. He can, in fact, and he will deliver us out of your hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up for us. Even if he doesn't, we got to get in that mindset of, I'm believing God that you want to restore my marriage. I believe that you're going to heal my kid. I believe that my daughter is going to come back to you and serve you with all the fullness of her heart. I believe you for that. Mountain, be cast in the sea, and just have no doubt. And if it doesn't, it doesn't happen, God is still good, and he's still working out all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So again, you can't lose either way. So what I'm saying? What if we dared to believe this is true? That's how I'm living. So you know, don't wake me up, because this is how I'm really, you can ask my staff and my wife and my kids who have to tolerate this mindset that I have <laughs> where you know I, I, I walk in this but it's a fight again it's a 1st Timothy 6 12 and you'll be thanking God I'm wrapping it up right now 1st Timothy 6 12 the apostle Paul says to fight the good fight of faith man this is a fight people say a passive prayer oh and it didn't work Okay, he wants me to die, or whatever. It's dumb. Where is the fervent prayer spoken of in the book of James, chapter 5? Wow. Okay, so does that mean you deny the reality of your circumstances? No, man. Just look at it. Yep, I got that diagnosis, or yep, I got the divorce papers, or whatever the thing is. Yep, my boss told me, you're out of here. Um, it doesn't mean you ignore those. That they're, fine. There's that reality. But it means that we recognize that God is bigger and more real than our circumstances and dare to believe that he actually wants you to prosper and even be in good health, even as your soul prospers, as it says in 1 John. And so when you're in the midst of the storm and Jesus is calling you to go ahead and come on and walk on the water, to walk above your circumstances, uh, that requires that we follow the instruction of Paul from Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, where he says to set your mind on things that are above, not on the things of this earth, the things that are below. And as we do that, as we lift up our head and we see Jesus for who, is, who he is and who we are in him, remembering his goodness and his kindness toward us, remember that, that we are royal members of his holy family, heirs of God, loved and cared for, and in some incomprehensible way, already seated up in the heavenlies at the right hand of God in Christ, 
far above our current circumstances. Okay, believing that, we'll be able to walk through any storm with hope and courage and faith in the one who's standing with us through it all. Oh my gosh, and that is all I have to say about me.